Now, this is an oral history interview with Catherine Q. Seeley for the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're in the offices of the New York Times building in New York City, and today is Sunday, December 2nd, 2007, and I'm Brian Williams. Let's start with when you joined the Dole campaign and what it was like at that point and how did it feel for you as a reporter? I came on in November 99, probably late November, early December. I said 99, I meant 95. Right. Uh, and they were still, um, I'm not sure there was a very strong campaign headquarters uh, very organized effort at that point. He was still in the Senate. Uh, a lot of his interviews took place in the Senate. Um, the campaign headquarters was somewhere downtown. I'm kind of forgetting where it was. Uh, and I remember going there probably November, December, and uh, on the wall was a very striking picture of Dole as a young uh, lieutenant in the uh, in the army, and and there wasn't really much else in the office. It was uh, it wasn't one of those humming campaign offices that that you read about or that you see later in a campaign. And was that primarily because it was so early in the... I think it was early, and, uh, you know, Dole's very, um, like, likes to manage things, and I think uh, it was kind of a bifurcated effort. He was in the Senate, his staff was in the Senate, his focus was the Senate, so the campaign office was a sort of satellite area, I think that's how I'd put it. And what would bring you to the campaign office? Well, I went there to uh, to talk with people, to see what it looked like, just to get the um, sights and sounds. Uh, but for the first major piece that I wrote, which came out just after Christmas of 95, I had interviewed him in the Senate office, and I think I just went to the headquarters to to get the color, and uh, there must have been people there to interview. I don't quite remember who they were. Was this an assignment that you sought, or were you assigned to they the... They asked me if I wanted to be on the, be on the Dole bus. And your response was... Uh, yeah, I did. My, I had been uh, taking care of my father for um, um, about three, two and a half, three years at that point. He had died in October, and um, this was a sort of a sort of a break in my life. And I felt okay. I would uh, I would go out and. You know, covering a campaign is a 24-7 commitment, and uh, I had been, um, you know, I think I, I sort of welcomed the the chance at that point. But it's a it's not a job that a lot of people want, uh, especially as politics has gotten a lot harsher and the media more sort of fractured. Um, but I think in those in those days, it sounds like it's a hundred years ago. But um, back then, it was you know it was really a privilege to be asked to be the to be the campaign person on a presidential candidate. So your first interaction with Dole was, you say, in his offices. I had been uh, covering Congress for uh, about two years for the Times, but I was mostly focused on Newt Gingrich and the his contract with America and the first hundred days, and uh, that had been very consuming. And uh, I enc had encountered Dole a little bit, but uh, I didn't—I didn't really know him very well until I started covering the campaign. 
And in these early stages, did you have a one-on-one -on -one with him at all, or? Yeah, that first uh, profile, I, I uh, met in his office with him, and he had the fire going, and we sat in easy chairs, and um, yeah, he seemed um, much more sort of open and receptive than than candidates, I think, are now. And certainly, his opponent was the President of the United States, and it was very hard. You know, you couldn't kind of just drop by his office, uh, you know, stick your head in and say, do you have a few minutes? You mean you're comparing covering Clinton versus right. covering Dole? Yes. Right, right. right. <clears throat> Anything about that initial exchange that uh, you found particularly memorable? It was, he was extremely uncomfortable. Um, I think there's part of a preconception that comes with working for the New York Times. People uh, tend to think we're crazed liberals uh, and that, you know, we're coming from a definite political point of view. Uh, and I think that he might have shared that a little, although I know that he had a very good relationship with a number of Times reporters. So maybe it's just that we didn't know each other. Um, but I also think that he he didn't really like the whole scripted nature of what a campaign was about, and he would I think he could kind of predict the questions, and as you know, you know he's not a uh, he's not somebody who um, takes a question and runs with it. He's more uh, very um, a man of few words, and so I think he he didn't much like the what this whole process was and was going to be. Did you have any particular strategy to disarm him, or did he have any particular strategy to disarm you? And I know it's thinking way back, but uh, anything stand out? Not that I recall. It was a fairly business-like exchange. Yeah, but it was, as I say, it was sort of homey. He had a fire going. We were in easy chairs. Um, it was very ornate, lovely office, not like spare like this one. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't really remember whether there was any particular strategy. I'm sure I had, like you, I had my questions, and I'm sure that he, he had kind of heard them all before. So it wasn't that interesting at that point. And you say it lasted about an hour? I think so. And how soon after that did your profile appear in the paper? A week or so. It appeared the day after Christmas. And if you had that profile to write again, uh, would you have said some things differently, or is it pretty much what, how you felt then and, and now? Well, it was the very beginning of a process, and I think it reflected things that I was beginning to learn about him. I would write a completely different profile a year later after spending time with him. But I've just gone back and reread it now in preparation for talking with you, and am kind of interested and, and surprised at how a lot of it does hold up for that time. Um, were other New York Times reporters assigned to his campaign as well at that point? Or? After he got the nomination, a second uh, reporter came on, Adam Nagurney. But up until he, time, when you say got the nomination, you mean Up until the convention. The convention. You were... Right. The eyes of the times. Right. On, on Bob Dole. Okay. Um, you know, let me correct that. I'm pretty sure it was. Up, uh, I'm pretty sure it was. It was. 
at the convention that we that we took on a second person, but I could be wrong. Um, I mentioned uh, before we started uh, the State of the Union response that Dole gave uh, in January. Um, talk about that for a moment. I just went back and, and had, had read a couple of those clips. Uh, he, he had a set piece to deliver, and the, uh, the other Republicans on the Hill had their talking points. And when Clinton gave his speech... Uh, the other the other Republicans felt like, oh no, he sort of preempted a lot of what we want to say, and the others sort of went off their talking points. Dole, who was delivering a delivering the response, uh, stuck with his speech, and afterwards a lot, and he was very harsh toward Clinton, and a lot of people found it sort of dissonant because he was criticizing Clinton for for some things that uh, actually he hadn't said or um, or that Clinton had softened and Clinton of course was the great triangulator and and much of his strategy was to undercut what Dole would say Dole, the Dole campaign was not, or Dole himself uh, were not fast enough on their feet to uh, to adjust to that um, that sort of change in direction, and he he was he he came across as a very um, harsh uh, um, critic of the president, but but also didn't do well at selling the Republican program either. And he really got uh, beat up for it over the next few days. How how did the the press corps respond to it, and were they doing some of the beating up? Well, the traveling press corps, we, as I recall, left Washington. I think with him that night, or very first thing the next day. I forget where we were going, but we were in the air while a lot of this was going on and remember this is pre-internet so you didn't have instant blogs and you didn't have a lot of cable chatter Uh, so in those days it took a little while for reaction to kind of bubble up and but by the time we had the first event with him the next day there was you know this criticism was in the air and uh, I think he was a little flustered. I think he was, it, it was one of the first times I would see his, his um, not impatience with the press, but his, his uh, sort of dismissiveness of the process and the media process. Uh, the... Um, I think he just he didn't he didn't like to be scripted he didn't like to be managed he didn't like to be told what to say um, and he often rebelled at that kind of thing and I think he just thought oh this is another little firestorm you know as, as majority leader it was his job to put out little fires and. I don't think I don't think that the campaign or he quite realized that these little brush fires what appear to be little brush fires in the Senate took on a different significance when you were on the national stage. So I just think he was kind of impatient with the whole thing. Do you happen to know uh, the protocol uh, surrounding the State of the Union address? Uh, does the president share a copy of the address with the member of the opposite party? Does it go through a process like that? I have a sense it might not because I well, I always the pre- we usually get because the address is usually nine o'clock at night. We get advance copies. 
Now, Clinton was always rewriting up to the last minute, so that wasn't necessarily helpful. But you, you get the drift of it. With Clinton, would you would get it a copy of the text, but yeah. it just might not be the one that he delivered. It might not be the one he delivered, and you might get it three minutes before he actually delivered it. So if, if the opposition party gets a copy, uh, it's, it's, usually, uh, it's usually late. So that is a real challenge. But, to... but it is a challenge. But, but now there are all kinds of leaks, and you'll have CNN reporting two hours before you know, the president is expected to say X, Y, Z. I mean, you pretty much kind of know what tack they're going to take. Because the texts are, are issued. Because the text on. is out there. Um, when you joined the, the uh, campaign, uh, was there already a sort of um, um, consensus among the reporters that things were going well, not going well, good candidate, bad candidate? Was there sort of a When consensus? I joined, there wasn't really a press corps at that point. It was a few a few people who were coming in now and then. There was no bus at that point. There was no plane. I'm, I'm thinking of the plane after the State of the Union. Uh, so that was January 20th. But when I first joined during December and early January, there, was, there wasn't a critical mass. So as, as the critical mass developed, uh, when new reporters joined the Corps, uh, if I were in that position, I would come up to someone like you who had been around for a few weeks or a month or so and say, well, how are things going and what do you think? That's a logical thing to assume. Um, what people don't realize who haven't been on these things is that they're very competitive. And uh, and also, people often don't want to show that they might not know something. So initially, I think, uh, you're not this band of brothers um, following each other around, following the candidate. You're you're still renting your own cars to catch up event by event. You're going uh, selectively to event. You might not be at the same. Uh, you might not choose to run after the same event because it takes a while to get there. Although he didn't have that many events in those days. And after a while, people do, you know, new people come on board, and um, and I think in Dole's case, there were a lot of people who knew him from the Senate, and that there there was a sense um, that this was not a, a juggernaut campaign. I think that was kind of evident. Um, but it really, you know, it took a while to unfold to see exactly what would be going on here. So if if you're talking about the early stages, uh, I don't think there was any kind of meta-narrative yet. But one eventually did I think develop. so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At what stage? We may be getting ahead here a little bit. But. Probably... During those first primaries, New Hampshire, South Carolina, um, pretty early on. Well, let's if, if you want to talk about that, yeah, I we think. Can, or... Well, let's let's build up to it. <laughs> um, at what point did the bus or the planes start to kick in and the critical mass reach a significant size? You know, I I hate to say that I really can't quite remember. Um, uh, I think we first had a bus somewhere before the just before the New Hampshire primary, which was late February. So, would the or, media attention 
uh, in Iowa have been uh, less intense than, say, we're observing Oh, right I think now? so. Uh, there were a number of candidates, as there are, well, there are more now, um, I'm sorry not to be helpful here. I don't remember that much about Iowa. Really? Did you go there often? Did he go I there went, often? Oh, yeah. I went there with him. I mean, I'm, I, I went there and then caught up with him at events. Um, but also, I mean, he was a very... Um, it was a very diffused kind of effort. It, it wasn't like, you know, you've got candidates now who have been doing this for um, almost a year and in a very intense media environment. In 95 and 96, early 96, it was just a different sort of Atmosphere. There wasn't this sort of 24-7 coverage. Uh, and his events were not uh, big, earth-shaking events that would be recorded by TV and played at night. Uh, and also, I mean, he didn't have much of a message. So it wasn't like... Um, he's hammering home a theme every day and you remember vividly uh, the big crowds and the points that he was making. I mean, it was much more casual. So that, I really... Maybe I just didn't go back and read the right clips, but I, I don't really have much of a memory of of Iowa. My first real vivid memory was just before the New Hampshire primary and catching up with him in a big he had gone to a um, I think it was a snowmobile uh, area where or where people were skiing or snowmobiling and uh, he went into a little coffee shop there and um, just had some chit chat with a with a waitress, and uh, there were a bunch of reporters around, and and um, and word spread, you know, that he was having mashed potatoes or something. And I mean, it was very trivial, but uh, but it was just a vivid scene for me because I think it must have been maybe the first time there was a real uh, intense pack around him. And he didn't know what to say to the waitress. And, you know, it was just sort of a typical campaign stop. For some reason, just the imagery of, I guess it was cold and snowy, and there were a lot of people around. Was it a pack of, of New Hampshireites, or was it a pack of reporters? Mm, or a, a lot of, of it New Hampshireites, and, um, and some other reporters were starting to come in at that point. So I think there that's what I would say maybe in retrospect was the the critical mass starting to develop. Um, I don't want to linger too long on, on the on the primaries, uh, but I want to get you know if you have some other vivid memories, we should uh, re record those. Um, but just logistically. Um, how, how you, you say you'd catch up with him in Iowa, so would that mean you'd fly out independently? Right. You'd fly out independently, rent you rent a car, you drive to the event. And then someone tells you, well, tomorrow or later today he's going to be so, right. somewhere else, and you hope that you can get there as fast as he Yeah, does. and now these days uh, the candidates have much more hectic schedules, and you really have to pick and choose, and you'll say, all right, I'll... I'll fly to uh, Des Moines, but I'm going to have to miss. He's the candidate may have a event scheduled back in New Hampshire, and there's no way for you to get there and then get back to the next event. So you really have to pick and choose. 
And so right through the primary season, uh, were you doing that sort of, you were an independent? Well, no, they, I think they, I, I, I wish I could remember more clearly. They got a bus at some point. And I think it was, it might have been after, it might have been right around the New Hampshire primary. And when you say bus, that, the bus start? By bus, I mean um, sort of the larger um, um, vehicle <laughs> for, for transporting the press, whether it's a bus that, it usually is a bus or vans that take you from event to event within a state, and then there's a plane at that point. And uh, although Dole had no money, so getting on, uh, uh, you know, the charters, his 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 planes were very small, and the press corps then was very small too. Uh, but sometimes you would still make your own arrangements to get from A to B. So you'd fly into a city, and the van or bus would be there waiting for you. Well, eventually that was the case. So about what point did that happen? Maybe shortly, you know, maybe late February, March. So from then on... Uh, but but not constantly. Uh, these campaigns are all blurring together, Uh I was on Bill Clinton's bus in 92, and uh, his was, he, attra- he attracted a, um, a bigger press corps earlier than Dole attracted in 96. And then, of course, for Clinton, by 96, it was Air Force One, and everything was organized and, you know, sort of precision drill. Um, uh, Dole had never run and uh, had, had run a national campaign, campaign, hadn't worked out that well, but didn't have uh, the logistical people on the ground who were doing the buses and the planes quite, uh, quite to the extent that certainly not in 96 what Clinton was doing. Um, but you know, you rely on people from previous campaigns who know how to do these things, the advanced people and all of that. Um, but a, as I recall, and I, I, my memory is very hazy on this, but I, I, it didn't really come together for a while. But when it finally did, uh, was the campaign eventually responsible for uh, the flights? And- oh, yes, yes. And they bill... You and there's always a tussle about does it go on your personal credit card, uh, which the campaign always wants, or can it go to your newspaper or your network? Uh, and what a lot of campaigns do is is they because you know it costs a lot to do this is they start charging the press they want to have a bus and charter planes and vans. Uh, Quickly, because then they can start charging the press for these things, and they will charge the press for you know you arrive at an event and there will be a banquet of food and caterers, and they charge the press for that kind of thing, and then you look over and it's all these campaign aides who are there eating the food because you know they can't afford afford this. So uh, a lot of these campaigns are very very cleverly sort of finance themselves uh, through through billings to the press corps. So uh, <clears throat> after a couple of sort of semi-stumbles at the beginning of the primaries, uh, he then, I guess, won eight in a row or eight on one Super Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it became apparent he was going to be the nominee uh, because he compiled, I guess, the the delegate votes at at some point. Um, I have a suspicion that because uh, I've read so often that Dole would go, would have a prepared speech in front of him and then ignore it, 
or shuffle the cards or whatever, that he might have been a more interesting candidate to uh, listen to as a press person as you went from stop to stop to stop because you never quite expect know what you expected and it was less likely, you tell me if I'm wrong, that you would be hearing the same speech over and over again. That's exactly right. He was, uh, he was famously unscripted and unscriptable and he would arrive, I remember going to a school once and the whole idea was to give a speech on education and he got into the school and he said not word one about education. And it was actually kind of hilarious for us as we began to be a, be a, a bigger group that traveled constantly together. Um, you're exactly right. Uh, he, would, he would famously sort of ad-lib his way through speeches. And uh, often his transition word was, wow, whatever. You know, he would he would just constantly say whatever. You know, sort of throwing the whole thing up in the air. Um, but it's also true that that um, he had, uh, as you know, uh, disabilities and was una- unable to. Um, you know, his hands didn't work right. And I did a story with him on. Um, on April 14th of 96. April 14th is the date that he was wounded in Italy, and he always, uh, every April 14th, would do a big disability speech in the Senate or, um, in this case, on the campaign trail. And I was, they... The campaign decided that they this was maybe something that they wanted people to have a better idea of. So, and I wanted to do a speech in a, a story, in anticipation of that uh, that coming April fourteenth. And he talked to me at some length about uh, what his disability actually meant to him in terms of his day, just having to lay out his clothes and use a button hook and. And he would occasionally drop these little things into speeches. He was very uncomfortable talking about this on the on the uh, campaign trail. But but um, the reason I'm bringing it up in this context was there was a day that he was supposed to give a speech on a particular topic. I don't remember what it was, and uh, he seemed to cast the speech aside, said nothing about what the topic was supposed to be. And I learned later that uh, the staff had put his speech on a lectern. It was a, a slanted, had a slanted top on it. And he also had to hold the microphone. There wasn't a microphone there. He couldn't hold the speech and hold the microphone. He didn't have two good hands, so he let the speech go. He didn't know what he was supposed to say, and he just ad-libbed. So there were sometimes physical reasons why he didn't say what he was supposed to say. But I think in the bigger picture, he, he, didn't, he just chafed against this whole idea of giving a scripted, uh, detailed focused uh, speech about a particular topic. Uh, he wasn't comfortable. It's very, he's, he's a very hard man, I would think, for a speechwriter to write words for um, because his, his own vernacular is so his um, that I don't think, you know, he's just not comfortable reading complete sentences, you know, he has sort of little spurts of, of thoughts about things, but he's not comfortable speaking in full sentences and complete paragraphs and chapters the way certainly Clinton was, so that was a big contrast with him. It, just spontaneously, uh, can you imagine uh, 
President Dole giving a State of the Union address, considering what you've just said? Well, you know, we saw him give his acceptance speech at the convention, and he did get through it. Um, uh, no, I mean, it's considering the things that that a president has to do, the many, many circumstances that arise. Dole was a legislative deal deal maker, and he was very comfortable in the legislative vernacular and the legislative mechanics of things. And I think, and in saying to somebody, hey, what do you want? Or, hey, can you do this? And I think actually he, you know, he's not, I don't think that ideologic. I don't think his, he didn't have like a grand vision, which was part of the problem in terms of of speech giving. I think he was much more comfortable in, in, uh, you know, in the cloakroom trying to broker a compromise and it's it's a whole different skill from being the things a president has to be a um the the uh the um commander in chief the the compassionate person in chief the person after a 911 who brings people together the person after Oklahoma City who can or Columbine who can mourn and grieve with people and also lead them out of that. I think that's a wholly um, unlikely role that Dole would be comfortable in. You mentioned that uh, you had advance word that on that one occasion at the school this topic was going to be education and I get the the feeling that the staff was tr- trying to organize this and was wanting to say to you, okay, now here, we're, this is going to happen today. And then it wouldn't. That happened on many occasions. So, so the candidate and the staff were sort of not working together. I think really. that's, uh, yeah, that was constantly evident on the trail. And to get back to your original question, um, yeah, it was, it became sort of an entertainment for the press corps. It was, it was fun to watch because you never knew what he was going to say. And candidates now are so scripted. Um, and, you know, you can usually mouth the words right along with them. But in his case, he would just, uh, he would veer off into um, uh, some, you know, really strange things. It was very, he had a very stream of consciousness style. And uh, if you had listened to him for a long time, you could understand what he, what he was saying. But he was not, he never connected the dots. And he often uh, would, would skip over the heart of something. And, and often the heart of something was the, you know, this life story. I mean, his campaign was based on his biography. He was uh, you know, in 1996, he had turned 73. He had spent, you know, more than three decades in Cap- on Capitol Hill. Uh, he was not perceived as somebody in touch with what was going on in America. His campaign was based on, and he was not that ideologic, and I think he was navigating through uh, what the various factions of the party wanted. But he was not, uh, you know, he didn't have a big message. So it, he, kind of forgotten what I was going to say here. He, he was, um, he was stumbling as I am now, uh, Um, 
I've, a number of people have said that 96 was Dole's turn to be the candidate. Uh, does that figure into your thinking here? Yeah, very definitely. He, uh, the Republicans have had a habit in the past of nominating somebody because it's their turn. And there was a big feeling about Dole that because he had run twice before, he had run as vice president, he had served as majority leader longer than anybody else, and or as leader because he was both in the minority and majority, uh, that it was his turn. And I think that that contributed to the kind of diffused nature of him as a candidate. He didn't have a compelling message on the trail. And so some of these scripts that he was handed, um, they were they were being cranked out by a campaign that saw, yes, we need to be a little better organized. We need to be saying X, Y, and Z. We need to be hitting these buttons. But his own, his own, uh, his whole M.O. was just to sort of wing it. He was quite famously, uh, quite famously winged it. And in uh, Richard Ben Kramer's book, What It Takes, uh, he asked him, you know, why, why would, why would you want to be president? And he said, well, you know, I have no agenda. Um, and repeatedly, uh, Voters would ask him on the trail in 96, well, why do you want to be president? And I remember one day the, this question came up a few times, and and he said, uh, at one point he said, um, well, it's easier than dealing with a hundred, it's easier to be president than to deal with a hundred prima donnas in the Senate. And then someone else asked him, well, so why is it you want to be president? He, he would say, Elizabeth. You know, because his wife was so wonderful. That was why he should be president. I mean, there was no coherence to it. So, yeah, I think there was a constant battle, and his staff was very aware of this, that there was no consistent message no, and no, no compelling reason uh, that was coming across, and it was, it was a disaster for him. How, how can it be that someone as intelligent as he is, and that is displayed in how well he played the role of leader, uh, can be so unaware of not having the things it needed that he needed to have in order to be a successful presidential well, candidate. Well, that raises a good question. Uh, and he constantly, it sort of makes you wonder if he really wanted to do this and wanted to be president or whether he kind of thought it was his turn and really wasn't that prepared. Uh, he was a very subversive candidate. He was always kind of sabotaging himself uh, in funny ways, little ways, um, uh, and actually did so with his wife when she ran, she ran for president and became known that he had actually contributed to one of her rivals, John McCain, who was an old friend of Dole's. Um, Can you think of other instances? I'm trying to think of, of, of uh, there were just moments in speeches when he would he would say something uh, that either again was sort of a stream of consciousness thing that just kind of petered out, or. Uh, would contradict what he would just had just said, and he would then he would just say whatever. I mean, you really got the sense that he didn't. It, it, you you speak of his intelligence. I mean, it's it's partly that he was so smart. He saw the whole thing as a sham, and you know he knew it was kind of not a joke, but it was. Uh, he didn't want to uh, become a cardboard person who would do, you know, who would step on the right chalk mark on the stage. Uh, he just, he, cha he chafed at that kind of um, 
uh, uh, that kind of control. Uh, one hilarious time I remember being, I think we were in Bakersfield, California, and he was, um, we were in a big warehouse and he was giving a speech about agriculture. He was very, he, he did sort of remember to stay on script when it was about farm issues because he, I think that, that, that was something very important to him. But it was at a time when, um, uh, there had been an issue with uh, Clinton's. Uh, there was an FBI list. Are you remembering this? I, I just have a vague recollection of the uh, the the white the Clinton White House had done something with um, FBI records, and Dole was very fired up about this, and he just veered in the middle of this speech. Uh, about farm issues to he was suddenly talking about the FBI and then he went from there to his wife Elizabeth being at the Red Cross and asking for blood donations and he went from that to talking about his dog leader and it was all in this just mishmash of things and I remember as it as it started to unfold I I started typing furiously, you know, taking down his words, and his campaign aides were coming in from the side, and they were just, like, rolling their eyes, and they saw, you know, a few of us in the back just typing madly, and they, you know, they had been, it was sort of a sleepy, whatever, speech, and and they came, because they suddenly heard, like, what is going on? And, you know, I mean, this would happen fairly frequently, and uh, and the voters were just, like, completely puzzled, you know. I mean, he would just, just run off the rails. And whether it was intentional, whether he was kind of bored with some of these, you know, he didn't want to stand up and give a speech about some, he didn't want to pontificate on some topic or, um, so I don't know. I think it was a combination of, knowing the whole thing was sort of a sham uh, and and a little bit of rebellion um, and a sense that he really didn't have anything to say. In a way, it's almost uh, Shakespearean in in the sense that someone is thrust into a position, of course he sought it himself, quote-unquote, where you're, you're not able to be easily in command of what is expected or necessary. I mean, it really is quite a, as you're describing it, quite a, quite a situation. But you could see from the press corps' point of view that it was, it was entertaining. And later in the, uh, as one of the, uh, Clinton had a fundraising issue with somebody from Indonesia, and Dole would, he would just get up at the microphone and he would, he would say, Indonesia. Like that, it, that in itself would convey all of the fine points of, of this burgeoning scandal in the White House. And he wouldn't really lay it out. And I remember uh, what I was going to say before, that he would, um, uh, he would skip over the heart of the matter. In one speech he was giving, he was, he was, they were trying to make him, he, he talked about his biography, that was sort of the heart of his campaign. And the heart of his biography is this, um, recuperation period, this 39 months in, in hospitals, in surgery, um, multiple surgeries, trying to repair these wounds, get his strength back, get his life back. I mean, it was a miracle that he was alive. And that, the campaign thought, was really the heart of his story. And if people knew that story, then you know, it was just such a mark of character and determination and grit and persistence that that would be the reason 
to vote for him. And he would get into these, uh, he would be up before both small groups of people and large groups of people. And he would say, well, I, I went to high school and, and uh, joined the 10th Mountain Division. Then I, was in a ho- then, then I was in hospitals for 39 months. You know, and to go on from there, he would completely skip over the fact that he had been wounded and that's why he was in the hospital. The way he would tell this story, you'd think, oh, was he a doctor? You know, was he a medic for a while? You know, was he, um, you know, driving in an ambulance? I mean, you had no clue why suddenly he's in hospitals for 39 months. And uh, and that's, uh, to get back to the, that, that's what we were talking about earlier, this sense that, um, he just he wouldn't he wouldn't skip, stick to the script in this case i mean in the case of his injury i think he was actually a very um um shy person and very reticent you know grew up in the this generation that doesn't talk about feelings and here he is up against the emoter in chief uh who in 92 had Basically, his campaign was basically on the couch, and uh, and Dole was wildly uncomfortable with um, that much self attention and uh, and sharing feelings. And there were some famous times in earlier campaigns when he broke down, and there was a in seventy six when. Uh, Gerald Ford had picked him as his running mate, and he came back to. They were in Russell, and uh, and Dole started remembering the people in the crowd and what they had done for him, taking up this collection, and and he's his voice cracked, and he he broke down, and and Ford then stood up and started applauding, and this just washed over the whole. Arena, and I think Dole was very self-conscious of of having that happen again, and uh, so he avoided, for many reasons, avoided talking about this part of his life, and yet the campaign saw this as a gold mine in terms of putting forth who this man really is. And and you said that you had had an interview with him where he did discuss. The difficulties he had. He did, and this was this was by this time April because it was just in advance of his April fourteenth right. commemoration, and uh, and by that point he did uh, he talked about the difficulties he has. You know, day to day he use cu- uses cufflinks instead of uh, buttons. He um, he uses a button hook to. And he tries to do that in advance. He allows an extra 50 minutes every day just to get dressed. And he lays out his clothes in advance. 50, 5 minutes. Um, he asks restaurants to cut the food before it comes out. I think, you know, he and Elizabeth were a huge power couple in Washington, but they weren't part of the social swirl. And I think part of that was Dole was... Uh, uncomfortable. He couldn't really eat. You know, they weren't big dinner party people. She would cut his food. They much preferred, he much preferred to be at home. So after he, uh, he, he got the, the votes necessary to get the nomination, uh, he took a vacation in Florida, I think for like 11 days or something. And then it's a little unclear to me what happened since the end of the sort of primary season and the convention. I guess there was he was doing a few things. He was out of money. They were the campaign was selling off its assets. He had something like a hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars to get him from um, probably May, June, July, August, four months. That's nothing. And his campaign sold off computers and phone lines and um, and uh, scaled back in staff. 
and uh, you know they just basically couldn't afford couldn't afford a plane. Um, so that was a yeah that was a very desultory time for him. Uh, and again, you know, they didn't have much of a message. So, um, one other question. You, you mentioned his effect on audiences, uh, but just a little bit more of, of, of that. There was this, the, you know, every campaign has, uh, churns out signs and gets a crowd together. Uh, and, you know, there, there were a lot of Clinton haters, so no matter who the Republican nominee was going to be, there would be, um, you know, a certain sort of base level of enthusiasm for that person. But he often, because his, what he was saying on the stump was so sort of disconnected from itself and from reality, um, audiences were often just very confused um, by the end, once you got into the general election, and not to get ahead of us, but uh, he, he, people were pretty whipped up, as they are in most campaigns. Um, but, you know, these were not, there were not diehard uh, dole people. They were largely Clinton haters who, I think, kept the, kept what enthusiasm there was alive but you know these were not if you could compare them to the Clinton crowds uh, you know there was no comparison um, they were usually pretty small crowds early on uh, and 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 often you know he had people like Steve Merrill who was the governor of New Hampshire and he had some other uh, surrogates, usually other Republican officials, uh, introduce him. And those people usually could whip up a crowd so that by the time he came on, he didn't really have to say very much. I, and I'm talking about the big set pieces that every campaign has. Right. So let's move forward then to the convention. Um, any recollections you have in particular of the convention? It was, uh, I think they, they, uh, they picked Jack Kemp by this point. They, they were, uh, remember we came into San Diego by boat. Uh, and that was sort of, there was quite a bit of fanfare about that. Uh, the other memorable things about the convention were Elizabeth's performance and she was so polished, and she was moving around the stage with a microphone. And uh, and I was with Dole in his hotel room watching the convention and watching Elizabeth. And then after she spoke, the states were doing their roll call. And by this time, uh, obviously, he was the he was the nominee. I mean, there was no tension, and it was. It was, again, it was the stream of consciousness dole sitting there watching the convention on television, watching himself being nominated. And he kept up this kind of running patter as each state would say, you know, the great state of Nevada. Uh, and dole would, would say something like, oh, yeah, they're the biggest... They've got they they mine more silver in Nevada than in you know he would come up with these little encyclopedic facts about each state or the uh, when the Rhode Island delegation got up uh, he was looking and saying well, where's Chafee you know I don't I don't see Chafee on TV and it was it was it was very entertaining because it was so um, he was so sort of out of body you know I think he couldn't quite believe that here he was actually on the verge of becoming his party's nominee, something he had tried several times before. And he just, 
he still was referring to himself in the third person. And he was, he was a TV commentator commenting on Bob Dole uh, getting, this, getting this nomination. And it was really funny as this roll call was was uh, as the votes were mounting up and he just was uh, was like a a sports commentator on this and that. And then uh, Elizabeth arrived up in the room and uh, uh, there was a, Dole was on the couch and Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa, was there and Jack Kemp, his um, vice presidential nominee. And they were sitting on the couch And Grassley didn't move off the couch when Elizabeth came. I mean, everybody, there were were one or two photographers in the room, and there were a few, uh, you know, a few friends around. And clearly, everybody expected and wanted Elizabeth to sit next to him on the couch. Grassley wouldn't get up, and it was as if he wanted to be in the photo op. So Elizabeth, although she was in a a tight yellow uh, suit, skirt, uh, she kneeled on the floor beside him. And it was the only way to get the two of them in the photo op. So that was kind of a funny, uh, you know, he wouldn't tell Grassley to leave, and Grassley wasn't going to leave. Um... And about how many reporters were in the room? Well, it was a pool event, so I was there. I'm not sure any other reporter was in the room. And there was a pool photographer and then a few of his friends. And he did allow himself a very small uh, uh, glass of scotch that was there on the table, and then he, he quickly moved it out of the way when he saw a photographer about to... Um, you know that that was going to be in the shot. He was he was aware to that extent. Um, this commentary, this running commentary, he was doing was that for Grassley's benefit or for your benefit or just sort of. I think it was. I think it was just him. I, I think he didn't know how to quite respond. As I say, he's on the verge of achieving this enormous uh, accomplishment, and uh, it was a little bit. Daunting and frightening, and but I think that to me that's the real dole in a lot of ways. Just um, kind of batting things around, stream of conscious, funny, very funny, um, and just like this event is washing over him. You know, he's not in control. It's it's you know by focusing on the little things, it's a way. Uh, to deal in an unemotional, um, you know, a sort of, it's, it's a distancing thing. Um, and, you know, you realize his own, just his knowledge of all of the states. I mean, he knows the amount of silver mined in Nevada. He knows uh, everybody in all the delegations and um I think he was just, it was also just, like, fun and kind of amazing. Probably a fair amount of relief in there, too. Yeah. 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 So take us through, then, the general election and what thoughts you have on that and the the two debates. Okay, do do you want to stop for a moment? Could we? Let's uh, move forward to the end of the campaign uh, when Dole did his 96-hour marathon. What, and what, let's start with what was that like for you? Well, it was uh, very intense because you've uh, you're you know basically awake for 96 hours, and um, there weren't you know when you're dashing from place to place. You're you're not uh, you don't have phone lines in all of these places because they're just really you touch down on the tarmac and then you're gone. So it was very hard to file. There were a lot of logistical problems from a media standpoint. Um, but it was 
you know, it was a big, fun adventure, and everyone sort of knew this was the end. And, and uh, Dole, I have a, a picture I took of um, Dole coming back on the plane in the middle of the night, and uh, Ed Walsh, the uh, Washington Post reporter, was sitting there and had fallen asleep with his mouth open. And Dole, who was wearing a black leather jacket that somebody had given him at one of these stops, um, came in from the forward part of the plane and saw Ed there, and he and he went like this. And I got a picture of him at that moment, and it's... It's a very funny moment because it's, you know, here the press is bedraggled and uh, falling asleep. And Dole actually looked quite refreshed. And even though he's the one who was 73 and, um, and that had been something of an issue, but he, uh, he, was, he milked that moment quite well. Mm. During the course of that 96 hours, uh, did he feel a responsibility to keep your pep up and whatnot? I mean, was he trying to bring you along or not? No, I think he was, what he was doing was trying to come to terms with the fact that he knew he was going to lose. And it was during those 96 hours, you know, they started out very peppy. And then uh, during them at a stray event here or there, he would say something that we would interpret as his knowing that he had lost. And and as the hours went on, the events were increasingly kind of pointless and had no energy and they were small and uh, and increasingly bizarre. At one point we were at a um, some kind of space, something in near Los Alamos, not Los Alamos, or um, it was it just very um, bizarre. But the for me the emotional high point was we were at a bowling alley in Des Moines, and it was the middle of the night, and there were you know, a few people around. It wasn't like a big rally. I mean, it was literally the middle of the night at a bowling alley in Des Moines. <laughs> um, and Dole was standing, he stood in front of the bowling pins to make a little speech. And these people are like, I mean, these are nighttime work, you know, daytime workers who get their break at night. And, um, they're wondering, you know, what is the, you know what is this carnival that's suddenly come and interrupted our game? And uh, John McCain was traveling with him at the time, and McCain was a real, you know, Dole was such a sort of loner really during the whole campaign, and he didn't really have a buddy along with him or a confidant, and um, and I think McCain provided that uh, uh, companion role for him toward the end. And and they had this bond, even though Dole had been in World War II and McCain had been in Vietnam, they really had this, uh, this, this bond of the harrowing experiences that they had gone through. And, uh, and McCain... Dole, Dole spoke in front of the bowling pins, and it, you know it was just meandering, and I'm sure he said something that we all interpreted as okay, it's over. And McCain, also knowing that it was over, uh, stood up in front of the bowling pins and basically gave a eulogy to the campaign. And uh, Dole started crying, and I remember having tears in my eyes. 
as McCain said, you know, this is the last of this great generation. And, you know, the last generation that really made a sacrifice. And it was really moving. And for me, I think that was the, that was the, the sort of emotional and official acknowledgement that, that this was over. And Dole knew that too. And um, we went back the next day. Uh, we were headed back to Russell, you know, back home. And it was um, uh, this sort of Odysseus finally coming home and uh, very emotional for him. And he goes into the voting, was going into the voting booth and uh, uh, one of the election workers, he gave his name, you know, he said Bob Dole and the election worker said, now how do you spell that? And he went into the voting booth and and uh, he and Elizabeth came out and there was a lot of um, uh, camaraderie with the election workers and the people in Russell. And, you know, everyone knew that this was the end and, and Dole actually got um, Kansas stakes for everybody mm -hmm. on the plane. It was sort of a, a gift to the traveling press corps. And then uh, we got back to Washington and he went home and then, um, and then there was a, uh, and most of us, the traveling press corps was from Washington so we had a chance to go home and dump our bags and, and uh, take a shower, vote. And uh, and then went to um, the arena where he, where he was giving his. They were watching the votes be counted, and and very quickly it was clear that that he had lost. And um, and he came out to give a speech. And one of the things he said in his speech was he thanked the press corps, and he said, you know, I know that you know. I've seen you up close every day, and you're out there and you're doing your jobs. And you know, I want to thank you for uh, for doing this. And he had he had so whipped up voters in the final days of the campaign against the press corps that that people started booing that part of his speech and. Uh, I think he was really taken aback. I mean, he was dealing with the enormity of the loss and um, was, I think, surprised at the at the animosity. We we skipped this part, but in the last days of the campaign, he had really um, he had gone on a tear against the press, and this was also part of the nineties. Just before the 96 hours, I think by the 96 hours it had calmed down a little bit. But uh, it seemed that the whole reason for his campaign was uh, to be against the liberal media. And uh, he used used the, the New York Times as his sort of symbol for the eastern elite liberal media and he would uh, he would go to these rallies and it was the most uh, surefire applause line that he would get and it was it was the most um, reliable way that he could work the audience into a fevered pitch and he would tell the audience rise up against the media and uh, he he did this fairly consistently in the South, in particular, where uh, you know the New York Times carries a lot of um, bad connotations. Not that it doesn't elsewhere in the country. And he would uh, you know just tell these people rise up, don't let the media tell you uh, how to vote. The media favors Bill Clinton. It's the Clinton. Uh, Clinton owned and operated media and 
uh, and he would work these people into such a pitch that they would, when we would be leaving, you know, you leave through a, uh, they have a little cordoned off area for the press, and people would be uh, hitting us on the way out, and they would be screaming at us. And, you know, this was, this was again, before the Internet and before a lot of, um, before there were really venues for all the people who hate the media. <laughs> and, and this was one of them. I mean, he gave vent to uh, this feeling that has been building for years and years against the media for many different reasons. Um, but but they were very very hostile to us, and he really played on that. And um, by the end of the campaign, you know, it had calmed down. That part had calmed down quite a bit on his part. But but his the the Republicans uh, who thought the press was in Bill Clinton's hands all along. Uh, the audience was still, you know, would not let that go. So during his concession speech, that was, it was really marred by, I mean, for him and, and Elizabeth too, uh, they were, you know, they were visibly shocked at how people were just booing at that point. And I think it, it probably, you know, it was a diversion, an, an unexpected, unintended a diversion from him from becoming emotional about the end of the ride and all of that, but um, that was that was the that's the lasting impression I have is of of that very angry uh, denunciation of the press. Did he reprove the the audience members, or how did he get? Yeah, back he on did. Track? Yeah, he did. He said, "Oh, come on, you know, I." I've watched these people. They work hard. Uh, this is not about them. Was Elizabeth on the whole ninety-six hour marathon? Or not? Yeah, or? she she was. But at one point, they a couple of points, the the motorcade had fall, fallen behind, and so she would leapfrog ahead to the next event because people would be wait. You know, they would have these um, crowds deliberately at various stations of the cross and um, and she would because they were behind she would sometimes jump ahead at least in the first 36 or 40 hours of that toward the end they were together and you all traveled in one plane right and they well no I'm sorry um, there were two planes but his plane was small, and so he only had uh, he had certain he had the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Wires, and a couple of other papers. We had permanent seats on his plane, but most of the press corps traveled in a second plane, and that's pretty standard for campaigns. Um, that must have or should have meant a few uncomfortable moments. And you all got back on the plane after he'd been rousing the crowd. Yeah, there was, there was, uh, he didn't come back on the plane very much during that particular period. Would that be true throughout the general election pretty much? He stayed up forward? And yeah, you once all... in a while he'd come back. You know, if there was news event or sometimes he'd just come back and chat. And what was that like when he did come back? Um... Chat? It was it was fine, you know. It was um, helpful, very helpful for us. Uh, I think he liked to be his own spokesman. Um, not always very enlightening, but at least you got a glimpse of the guy that you were supposed to be writing about. So that's helpful. Some candidates don't come back at all. So would you characterize those moments as he was letting his hair down or just... Not hair? really. I think it was sort of a drop-by. Uh, you know, he didn't like to be questioned very much. He's not a, you know, a raconteur or a 
big chatterer. Uh, when he was rousing the crowd, uh, you were not identified as... The New York the Times, no. No, but, um, you know, certainly all of my colleagues knew who I was. But, but press areas often are, you know, there are a bunch of tables behind the... Uh, behind the audience, um, behind the stadium. So they don't always see us. But sometimes, particularly at smaller events, it's very clear who the press is. So when you're being led out, no, they didn't know who I was um, by newspaper, but just anybody part of the media crowd would get these uh, get these hits on your arms and people really screaming in your face. Unnerving. Uh, very, very. I mean, we're, I think we're a little bit more used to it now because the Internet has made, uh, uh, you know, tearing down the press a, um, a cottage industry. But, but in, in 1996, it was not that, co- you know, there was no real outlet for people's anger at the press, and, and Dole tapped into that. What is your rebuttal to the charge that the Eastern Establishment Press is biased? Well, I think in that case, uh, you know, Bill Clinton has often said that nobody has been treated as badly by the press as he has. So, um, I don't know, these broad charges of media bias. You know, when people say media, they mean everything from Geraldo to um, to Dan Rather to, um, you know, the local police reporter who sticks a microphone in somebody's face and says, well, how do you feel now that your son is dead? So, you know, that term media becomes just so all-encompassing. And, um, you know, I mean, I would ask someone to say, well, show me exactly what I have written here that you find bias. You were filing to an editor back here, is that right? Or, I mean, In Washington was... and New York, depending on the timing. Right, right. For the record, People weren't telling you what to say or what to see in these events that you were oh, covering. Oh, no, no. I think that's a big misconception that people have. They say, oh, um, you know, the New York Times, because they've read a columnist on the op-ed page, you know, or the editorial page, which uh, is, you know, had endorsed Bill Clinton in that campaign. Uh you know, they confuse the editorial stance of the paper and the liberal voices on the op-ed page with what the reporter on the scene is writing. And no, you're the one telling the editor, I mean, the editor is telling you, you have 800 words. <laughs> or, you know, trying to say, trying to coax the story out of you because it might be, well, it was sort of a mess today. You know, I don't really know what the story was. So the editor would walk you through and say, well, you know, what was the most important thing that happened? Uh, but no, they don't, they don't, in a circumstance, they, they're not dictating to you. You're telling them what you've seen on the road, what the candidates said. And We've been very careful in campaigns, especially at the end when everything is so heated, when most people are paying attention. We will have parallel stories from the Democratic candidate and from the Republican candidate. Uh, And they'll be, you know, they try as hard as they can to get, to make them of equal length, to have a picture of both candidates. Now, critics will say, well, you know, that's a false that's an artificial um, way of of trying to claim that you're not biased, but you see things through an Eastern liberal lens, and you know you don't even know when you're being biased. Um, in that 
particular campaign, I think they were, I think, you know, I know that Dole himself thought that um, that we were biased because he would make proposals. He had a big welfare proposal uh, in particular that I remember that uh, was not on page one. It was buried in the back of the paper. And, you know, when they would complain to me, like, well, that just shows you're biased, I said, there's nobody who wants my story on page one more than I do. You know, I don't like being buried back in the paper. That's obviously not my decision. Was it a bias decision? Uh, yeah, I mean, was it a decision made out of bias, or was it that something else, there was some other news that day that bumped that off the front page? You know, I don't know. I mean, we'd have to go back and look at those pages and see. Um, was it really a page one worthy proposal? Maybe not. You know, the candidate might like to think so, and his uh, campaign staff would be would like to say, well, yeah, I called up the New York Times and told them a thing or two. Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's lost in, I mean, in my my sense, it's sort of lost about why that story wasn't on page one, but that's the kind of thing they they would point to. And you didn't have any drag out fights with editorial people back here about, or, or did you, uh, about your stories being buried rather than on the front page if you felt that that's um, where they belong? No, that's not a fight that I... Some reporters take up that cause. I don't. Um, Dole had another complaint, not necessarily with your paper, but in general, that uh, there might be good events happening on the campaign trail, but the script that was developing was that he was behind, he was going to lose, and so on and so forth. Talk a little bit about how those scripts emerge and, and what their effect is. Well, I think with a lot of candidates, a meta narrative develops, and um, partly that's because the candidate does things to feed into it, and partly it's because it's it can become an organizing principle for a reporter following a you know a campaign is sort of a big messy carnival kind of thing and you know it can be a way that helps you um, organize the events of the day um, but and and you know I think Dole did sort of play into uh, an idea that you know he was casual about this he hadn't thought things through but but by the end, he was giving very uh, coherent, tight, energetic speeches, and I think our stories reflected that. Um, pla placement is a big issue for people when they in campaigns when they read the paper and and headlines, which are things that the reporter on the ground has no control over. Um, But I think, you know, we try, I mean, the best you can, the most you can do is try to reflect each event as a singular event, but you also want to give some context to, to a story. So if you say, you know, there are a thousand people here and it's amazing, um, there is a larger context. You know, you want to say it's... Um, it's uh, three days before the election, and um, we we probably do over overstate the role of polls. I mean, I think we have for a while, and I think we're that's been a problem, and we're trying to cut back on that. Um, but but that would be the context, you know. Yeah, maybe there are a thousand people here screaming, but. And and maybe he did give a good speech, but remember he's twenty points behind in the polls, 
uh, and that's you know that's not something that the campaigns would want to have people be reminded of. One could argue that a political campaign is an opportunity to educate the public on the issues of the day and the differences among the, the candidates. But it seems as if a lot of that the reporters and papers tend to drift and the networks to the to the um, and the uh, the game process. Yeah, and the horse race right. aspect of things. Right. And, and and so while there's there's the potential of it being an educational experience, it be, it becomes this horse race thing where the emphasis is on losers, winners, losers, winners. And that is a problem in a democracy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I agree. But I also think that's not the only coverage we provide. The national political reporter will be focusing on that. The candidate reporter, which is what I was, is focused on what did he do today, what did he say today. Uh, and we have we have a huge political staff, and we have stories that will... I mean, yes, there are people writing about the horse race, but there are also people writing about the details of the welfare proposal, um, doing comparisons between the candidates on various issues. Um, but, you know, in a time, of, in that particular campaign, it was a time of peace and prosperity. Uh, and... And as I say, Dole, I mean, even to this day, I'm not sure I could tell you why he was running or what agenda he had. Yes, his staff had written speeches on particular topics. And yes, he did things like propose a 15% tax cut after a life dedicated to balancing the budget. Um, so, you know, where are you left at the end of the day in, you know, what is the larger, how, what are we educating the public about, you know, and how, um, how genuine is this scripted, uh, this speech that, you know, how much of an education is this scripted speech s supposed to be for the public? And I, you know, I think we do try to say what he said that day, but often that's not very enlightening in itself. And so you do focus on some of the atmospherics and the crowd, and you talk to voters in the crowd, and, um, you know, I mean, voters don't stand there and say, well, yes, it's that 16-point uh, welfare uh, plan that, that really has me hooked, and I'd like to discuss that with you. You know, they'll usually say something like, uh, Clinton's corrupt, we've got to get him out of office. You know, I mean, that's the, especially at the end of a campaign. Um, so, yeah, I do think we focus on the horse race a lot, but I don't think it's what we do exclusively. And, I mean, I know it's not what we do. We do tons of other things. We provide lots of information to people. And, again, in those, I mean, really the striking difference is in the media today versus in 96, and, and it's hard to imagine a pre-Internet campaign. But, you know, nowadays uh, campaigns have everything is out there on the web, their websites, their, they have all kinds of ways of reaching people. And, um, you know, and we're part of the cog in the system, and we have a responsibility, I think, to analyze a lot of those positions. And I think we do that. And we, but we don't ignore the horse race. Uh, let's end with a, a few personal notes here. Uh, you wrote very very nicely about the birthday party on the plane. So I want you to tell that story. Um, 
There was a tradition on the Dole, Dole campaign of, uh, because he's up in the forward cabin and you don't really see him that much, if it's your birthday, you would get to go up and have a little photo op with him. And um, uh, again, this is the day before, the days before people had digital cameras and everybody was always taking pictures because it was still a privilege to be able to do that. And um, by the end of the campaign, you know, he's ranting about the New York Times and whipping up audiences into a frenzy. And uh, my birthday is November 4th. And um, so it was right, I think, I don't, I don't not remember, I think that was the day before the election, or day or two before the election, but it was in the, the uh, 96-hour swirl there at the end. And... Um, uh, the one of his aides came back on the plane, and it was just after we'd been to one of these events where he was railing against the New York Times, and they said, do you want to, uh, you know, the senator would like to see you and wish you happy birthday. And uh, I was sort of shocked because... Uh, even though you've got this physical proximity to people, you're not, you know, you don't see them very often. They really are, uh, there's a, a a wall between them and us. And, you know, my friends on the play, we sort of laugh like, my God, really? You know, what, what's, what's this about, you know? And uh, so I stood up, and, and he had actually come to the front of the press section. And I started walking up the aisle, and everybody was standing up like, wow, you know, what's going to happen here? And I got about 10 feet away from him, and I said, is it safe for me to come up there? And he had this big grin on his face, and he said, don't believe everything I say. And he then, he put his arm around me. And um, and someone took a picture. And uh, and a couple of days after the election, or day, I guess the day after the election, I was talking to the executive editor of the paper, and I was telling him this story. And he was flabbergasted by it. And he said, you've got to write about this. You've got to get that in the paper. So I wrote the story, and um, and we ran the the picture of him uh, with his arm around me, and uh, you know people were pretty amazed because it was in a way it was it was very um, affectionate and gentle, and and. By saying, don't believe everything I say, it was really Dole saying at the end of this, this year-long um, show that he knew it was a show, and he did it for, you know, he was playing a part, but that it was, that he was, that it wasn't personal, and uh it was it was both a very funny and very warm moment, and it it consisted in his putting his arm around you and having the photo op, but you didn't have a chat together. Um, you, uh, you you weren't escorted up to the front of the plane. You know, I I don't I don't think so. I I can't quite recall. And and if if I if I had been, it was very brief. But that was really the the moment. So what you're describing, and I've heard this from lots of other folks, is there are two sides to Bob Dole. At least. <laughs> I think he. Uh, I think there's the the one who went through through this campaign, the public part of him that went through this campaign. And then I think there's the, the legislative master who likes to make things work and who likes to chat with, uh, with reporters off the record and knows exactly what he's doing, you know, wants to convey messages through, uh, through the press. Um, 
you know, and I, th I think at the end of the day, he sees the press as a big part of the machinery, you know, this legislative machinery. And I think that's where he's most comfortable. I think um, uh, Michael Kelly, who who worked for the wrote for the New Yorker at the time, uh, wrote about the campaign and how what a how discomfited uh, Dole was as a campaigner. And he wrote something like, um, uh, "Watching Bob Dole campaign is a very dislocating experience. It's like watching somebody." wear their clothes in the shower or eat naked. You know, I mean, it was a great image of, I mean, that really is what watching Dole was like, you know, that he was, he was watching himself. He was sort of disembodied from this experience, too. Would you, would you do it over again if, if the same kind of situation arose? Well, I have been on subsequent uh, buses, and I think there comes... I mean, it's fascinating. You've got a front row seat to history. Um, but I think less and less happens on the road. You know, so much because, the, because, because again, of the Internet, uh, that more it's not it's not the central place where things happen anymore but also you know I'm older and it it really takes a even though Dole was 73 um, you know someone who wants to be away 24-7 or not wants to be away but it's not a problem if they're away 24-7 and you know, it's just living the life of a cowboy, and I've done that. Uh, I I did it. Uh, Clinton ninety two, Dole ninety six, Gore two thousand. Really on the bus full time for those uh, three campaigns, and that's that's probably enough. I did a little bit of that in in two thousand four, but I wasn't the main uh, campaign person. I think you get it out of your system after a while. So you left the campaign uh, that night in Washington where you went home and unpacked and moved on. Have you had many contacts with, with Senator Dole since? I've had a few, and um, uh, the, probably the most entertaining was when he was campaigning for his wife Elizabeth when she was running for the Senate in 2002 um, and he was going around campaigning for her in these tiny little towns in North Carolina and uh, he let me come along and I think he was having the time of his life and uh, he was in little diners in uh, on courthouse steps uh, at shopping malls and supermarkets, and it, it wasn't a breakneck schedule, but uh, but he went around a lot for her, and and people were enthralled with him because he at this point was was the Viagra pitch man and Pepsi and some of these other things, and uh, I remember being at one of these events in a little town in North Carolina. He was in a hardware store. And a guy walked in and said, oh, my God, you're Bob Dole. You know, I've got an eel farm a couple miles away. You want to come see it? So Dole says, sure. And he gets in his car, and he goes over to this guy's eel farm. And it's actually really disgusting. I mean, there are all these slithery, just, you know, slimy, gross things in this big tank and Dole is sort of walking around in his, you know, he's very um, polished and starched and uh, he's mucking around in this guy's you know, barn with these eels 
slithering all over the place. And he just, he was hamming it up and just having a great time. And, and he couldn't have been more gracious to me. And we sat and had a little piece of, I think, coconut pie in a little uh, diner. And he talked about the campaign. And he was just so much more relaxed than when he was in his own campaign bubble. You say he talked about the campaign, the 96... About her campaign. About her. Campaign. About her. And, and he talked a little bit about himself and, you know, how different this was. And it was, it was just a fun experience. And then he also, uh, he also uh, started appearing on television quite a bit as a commentator on, uh, during the um, 2000, and I think... Uh, during the 2004 campaign, he was a common, regular commentator during the primaries, and, um, and I did a story about him doing that, and that, that this was sort of a second career for him. And uh, so, yeah, those were um, those were. I, I I did chat with him a bit. In North After Carolina, 96. you didn't uh, reminisce at all about 96? Not really. Mm-hmm. No, he seemed happy to have it behind him. I'm going to pause now for a moment. How do you imagine uh, Dole will be remembered, say, 20 years from now? Well, I think he, you know, he was the last of the World War II generation. And in as much as that will be remembered in 20 years, uh, I think he was very emblematic of that generation. Um, I think that uh, that will be a big part of it. I think one of the indelible uh, memories of him, uh, and it's something that he fought against during the 96 campaign, was the image of Nix, being Nixon's hatchet man, and uh, the the line in the in the in the debate with Walter Mondale about the Democrat wars? Uh, I think he'll be remembered as as a very fierce partisan, um, even though he during his time in the Senate and after. He worked very closely with Democrats uh, across the aisle. And some of his closest friends were the big liberal lions in the Senate. Um, So, you know, that may be unfair that he's remembered that way, but that certainly was a big mark of his early political life. I think uh, if people remember him now, it probably will be as somebody who's cropped up on these late night talk shows he loves the loves the format and he's been on Letterman and Leno and uh, pitched Viagra and uh, and done some of that and and I think his sense of humor uh, really came through uh, and it's a, it's kind of a mixed bag for people in remembering him I think he's um, uh, you know, can't really be pigeonholed uh, because he was this a different kind of character within the Senate. Uh, his public image from the campaign, I think, is is uh, is you know there was there was nothing clear that he stood for. I don't think he'll be remembered as uh, in an ideologic way. But um, Moore is a creature of the Senate. He loved the Senate. And I think uh, that's, that's where he made his biggest mark in, in doing things that the public never saw. So I think, uh, I think probably as, uh, as, as, again, the World War II, you know, the last of that generation and embodying a lot of those um, the 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 ethos that we come to associate with that 
generation, you know, the sacrifice, the injury, the determination, the grit, the, the self-reliance, the, um, the strength in bringing himself back from, you know, I mean, he was left for dead. 